would for the very last time, at least the last time for a very long time, join me in taking your Bibles and go to John, the Gospel of John, for the very last time. Can you believe that? We have been studying the Gospel. I know Scott's over here shaking his head. It's like it's such a, it's a sad day, such a sad day. And it is. It's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey as we've learned so much in-depth theological and practical instruction from the lips of Jesus, which we'll continue this morning. But it is the last time that we will be in the Gospel of John. I had no idea two, two and a half years ago, whenever it was, that we started it. Yeah, that's, that's right. You heard me. We've, for a long time, we've been in the Gospel of John, but there's so much there. I had no idea that the, the journey would take this long, but I didn't want to rush it. There were times when I thought, oh, I'm just going to push through. And like, no, 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 there's, there's too much here. And so we've, just, we've taken our time, we've, we've drawn out all the richness of it, and I, there are no regrets, no regrets whatsoever. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. Uh, next week, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a long time. We're going to venture into the Old Testament, and we're going to tackle an Old Testament book. And uh, I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time. And there's, there's some Old Testament books I would love to teach through, but they're really big, and it would take a long time. To, but there's so much richness there as well, and it's so applicable to the day and age that we live in. So next week, I'm not going to tell you right now, we'll make it a surprise, I suppose. Next week, we will uh, begin our next study, but it, it'll be in the Old Testament. But now, let's, let's bring this book to a conclusion as we look at this final chapter here, these final verses, this epilogue, as many people refer to it. A lot of people tend to think that John had written his book, his letter, and sometime afterwards he decided to write this final chapter. We don't know that for a fact. That could be the case. It, it's a little disconnected from how chapter number 20 ended, and there's certain content in it that was necessary to address, particularly decades after the death of Peter, uh, many decades after the death of of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the birth of the church, and some things just needed to be addressed, particularly as they surround Peter. And so we're going to look at that this morning, in the, as you can tell, do you love Jesus? Which is the question that Jesus will be asking Peter multiple times. But I think on all of these final verses here, verses 15 through 25, it's, it's dealing with the subject of love in one way or another. And I'm reminded, as I teach on the end times, eschatology on Thursday nights, I'm reminded again and again that one of the marks of the final days of planet Earth is a lack of love towards God, and a lack of natural love and affection of mankind towards one another. This is what 1 Peter tells us. 2 Peter also tells us this. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 24. This is mentioned all throughout the New Testament, but particularly in the book of Revelation as it talks about that final generation and their lack of love. And one of the churches that is mentioned in the book of Revelation, the church of Ephesus, he says in Revelation 2 and verse number 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The church of Ephesus, interesting enough, that was the church that the apostle John, the one who wrote this book, the book of John, that was the church that he was an elder in. That was the church that for many decades he served in. And Jesus is telling him, write down these instructions to your church, the church of Ephesus. You have left your first love, which is really sad and unfortunate because what do we know John as? We know John as the apostle of love. John talked about love all the time. John wrote about love. He's like, you cannot read the writings of John without coming across the subject of love over and over and over again. It is something that he was passionate about. And yet, what is the condemnation? What is the, what is the, um, uh, the issue that Jesus said, I have this against you, I have this against your church? You've left your first love. There's always that that, that problem that we as Christians can face. We, we can become theologically sound and we can be doctrinally accurate and we can be orthodoxy in our practice, but then we're just, we've lost that passionate love for Jesus and for others. And in this text, Jesus is drawing Peter back to that. And so if you would look at it, verse number 15. I think beginning in verse number 15, you see the subject here, what I would call love for Jesus leads us to love others. 
And that'll make more sense as we, we read this, but let's go ahead and read verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, remember, um, they didn't catch anything all night long. Jesus had miraculously told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat. They brought in, uh, you know, 153 fish. They had brought it to shore. Jesus already had fish and breakfast prepared for them, and they're eating breakfast. And while they're eating breakfast, it says in verse 15 that Jesus said to Peter, I would imagine this is probably a private conversation. I don't know if the other disciples are listening in, but while they're eating breakfast, uh, maybe even Jesus takes Peter to the side, but he says to Peter, son or Simon, son of Jonah. Now that's, that's kind of like when your mom calls your name three times. Like my, my first uh, name is Charles. So if, you know, if my mom was angry at me, it was Charles Daniel Hager, get in here now. Uh, that, that, that's what, so if you've read the other gospels, you know, one thing is clear. Jesus rarely ever calls Peter by this name. He get, Peter was his nickname, Petros, which is, it's a, it just means pebble or small stone in the Greek language. And that was the nickname that Jesus had uh, given uh, to Peter. Peter is a nickname, that's, but that's what, that's what Jesus called him all the time. But anytime you see Simon, son of Jonah, in the Gospels, that Jesus only calls him that when he's rebuking him. In other words, Jesus is bringing Peter aside and saying, hey, you're, you're acting like the old man. You're acting like the old Peter, but I, I've given you a new name, and you're to be this new creation in me. But, and so he's, a, he's addressing an issue with Peter, and he asks him this question, do you love me more than these? Do you love me? And that's a question I, I want to pose to you this morning. In fact, I, I just remembered, I brought my Bible up here for a reason. I don't, I don't typically, I'm an odd pastor. I, this is probably the first time in years, believe it or not, first time in years I've actually brought my Bible to church on a Sunday. And that, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I always print out the text in, in uh, these big sheets of paper and I, and I read it right off of that. And uh, another reason is if I put my Bible up here, sometimes it won't hold it. The stand just goes down. I call it my 10-pound Bible. It's a big, heavy Bible. But I brought it this morning because I, I wanted to read some of the verses, uh, maybe all of the verses, from my psalm this morning. If you know me, you know that I study a psalm every Sunday morning. And my psalm that I was studying this morning is Psalm 136. And all I want to do is read the, the concluding phrase to each verse. Verse number one ends with this phrase, his mercy endures forever. Verse two concludes with this phrase, his mercy endures forever. Verse three concludes with this phrase, his mercy endures forever. Verse four, his mercy endures forever. Verse five, his mercy endures forever. Verse 6, his mercy endures forever. Verse 7, his mercy endures forever. Verse 8, his mercy endures forever. Verse 9, his mercy endures forever. Verse 10, his mercy endures forever. Verse 11, his mercy endures forever. Verse 12, his mercy endures forever. Verse 13, his mercy endures forever. Verse 14, his mercy endures forever. Verse 15, his mercy endures forever. Verse number 16, his mercy endures forever. Verse 17, his mercy endures forever. Verse 18, his mercy endures forever. Verse 19, his mercy endures forever. Verse 20, his mercy endures forever. Verse 21, his mercy endures forever. Verse 20. Two, his mercy endures forever. Verse 23, his mercy endures forever. Verse 24, his mercy endures forever. Verse 25, his mercy endures forever. Verse 26, his mercy endures forever. I don't know. I, I feel like God's trying to communicate something there. It, it just it appears to me that he's trying to say something. He's, he's trying to, you know, repetition is the key to learning. He's, he's trying to, to tell you something. What is he trying to tell you? His mercy endures forever. You remember when Peter asked how many times should you forgive someone? And Jesus said 70 times seven. And oftentimes we, we try to do the math on that. We're like, what is that? You, you mean you, we're supposed to forgive this many times? And it's actually an estological phrase. It comes from the book of Daniel. And what it means is, is it means until the end of time. Because that's what that phrase meant when Daniel, was, the prophet, was talking about it. And so what Jesus was telling Peter, how many times should you forgive? You forgive until the end of time. You forgive indefinitely, in other words. Why? Because his mercy 
endures forever. Why? Because his mercy is renewed every morning. Now maybe this morning you stepped into this place with a lot of guilt and a lot of regret about past sins, that you have let Jesus down again. And some of you have probably felt like, I'm no longer useful for ministry. Maybe God can't use me. Maybe I failed God one too many times. I, I, I've let him down again and again and again. I just don't think his blessings are possible. I don't think he's very happy with me. I, I don't think he's very pleased with me. I don't think that he loves me. Let me remind you, everything that Jesus had against you, he dealt with 2,000 years ago on the cross, and it has been cast into the sea of forgetfulness. It is as far as the east is from the west, and his mercy endures forever. He will forgive you again and again and again. This is the message that Peter needed to hear. Peter denied Jesus three times. And in this text, Jesus comes to Peter and three times asks him, Peter, do you love me? See, Peter feels like I am not worthy to serve you anymore. I have let you down at, at, at the most important time, too, when, it, when I should have been by your side, when, I've, when I should have stood courageously, I let you down. And yet the truth remains his mercy endures forever. But there's that guilt that on the back of Peter that needs to be removed. And that's that pride and arrogancy that he has been carrying as well that needs to be removed. And so he asks them this very simple question, do you love me? It's probably something that some of you need to hear as well. Maybe you're carrying the same baggage of guilt. Maybe you're carrying the same baggage of regret of the past, and you maybe some of you, you once years ago served faithfully in church, but because of some failures in your life, you've, you've kind of distanced yourself from church, and you've distanced yourself from God, and you've distanced yourself from serving passionately like you used to, because you feel like you're not worthy. You feel like you're not capable of serving God. Well, you are in good company with Peter this morning. And we all remember what Peter became, a passionate, fervent, faithful leader of the church, which means that's what you could become as well. And so Jesus asked the question, it's the only one that's relevant, it's the only one that matters for you to ask this morning, do you love him? Forget the past, do you love him right now? Now, in order to understand this text, I think, fully, you need to understand a play on words in the original language. In the Greek language, there are multiple words for love. There's a lot of words for love in the Greek language. There are eight that are, are commonly used, but I want to talk about seven this morning, seven words that are used. We use the word love so randomly and frequently in the English language, you know, I, I love sunny days, and I love disc golf, and I love apple pie, and I love my wife, and I love this church, as if love means the same thing in all of those statements. It certainly does not. There, there's a variety of meanings. I, I use the same word, but there's certainly a variety of meanings when I use that word in the English, and context tells us what the, the meaning of that is. However, Greek is a very precise language, and it, it, Greek uses the precise word for the pr precise feeling and emotion that's being conveyed. And so let me talk about a couple of these Greek words. Uh, one word for love in Greek is eros. And eros is the, the, the word for sexual desire. It is often used to talk about romance or lust. In fact, eros was probably the most common word used for love among the Greek-speaking people. Another very common word is phileo, and it is the love of affection. It's the love that defines friendship and close association. It is the love that two good friends have towards one another. It is, it is a love that is a faithful, enduring, and strong love. And then there's the love that outside of the Bible, it almost never appears in the Greek-speaking world. It's an odd thing, this word. 
Because if we didn't have, the, I've read historians that have talked about this word, if we didn't have the Bible, we really wouldn't even know what this word technically means. Because it's so rarely used in the Roman world, in the Greek-speaking world, that there wasn't enough, archaeologically speaking, to confirm what it was actually referring to. And it is the word agape, often referred to as agape. The word agape is an unconditional, sacrificial love. It is an everlasting love that is of the heart and not of the mind. It is not based on circumstances. It is a love that is of the will. It chooses to love no matter what the conditions. It is unconditional. And this is the word agape. And I'm going to come back to that one in a moment. And then there's the love storge. And it is the, this is a love that is a natural love. It's the kind of love that you see among family members, siblings and children towards their parents. And then there's the love, the, which is in Greek language, mania. We in English language, you've probably heard of the, the, the word maniac. Mania is the type of love in the Greek world that was an obsessive love. It was the kind of love that stalkers would have towards uh, individuals of fame. And so this was, a, <laughs> this was oddly enough, a, a fairly common love, particularly in the, uh, the gladiator times when people just loved and worshipped the stars of their... I'm sorry, that's just... Oh, okay, that's just like today too. Yeah, nothing really ever changes that much. And then there's the love called pragma. And pragma is where we get our English word pragmatic. This is the love of logical, practical things. It is the love that is based on duty and obligation and logic and so forth. This, this was a, a love that was used in common day-to-day -day work and so forth among the Greek-speaking people. And then there's the love of phila, and this one I always struggle in the pronunciation of, phila ashia. No, I did not say that correctly, but you can look it up on your own. This is, the, is self-love, another love that was very common in the Greek-speaking world. This, this is the type of love that one has towards themself. It's, uh, you could call this self-esteem in, in a modern terms. And so, once again, I think you get a sense here that in the Greek language, there, it gets very precise so that there's no question about what's being mentioned or what's being talked about and this is one of the things I love about Koine Greek, the proper Greek of the first century, is that when you read the Bible in the original language, you don't have to question what God meant. You have a language that tells you what God meant. You don't have to struggle over the context all the time and say, okay, I don't get it. Maybe the context will give me some clarity. Oftentimes, the, the words themselves give you all the clarity you need. And this is one of those times. Jesus, when he says, Peter, do you love me? In the Greek language, what he is saying is, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me not of the mind, but of the heart and of the will? Do you love me completely is what he is asking. But he also asks the, the question, do you love me more than these? And what are the these that's being referred to? And people have argued and debated over this for centuries. What are these? Well, it could boil down to three possibilities. One is maybe Jesus is saying, do you love me more than fishing and these boats and this occupation that you have since returned to? He could be saying, do you love me more than you love these other men? After three years, three and a half years, the disciples have become brothers they love one another. They will lay down their lives for one another. They, their, their, their kinship is so close at this point that they will never apart one another. And he says, well, maybe some would argue, maybe he's saying that, do you love me more than you love these men? Another is this, do you love me more than the other guys love me? So that's three possibilities. It could be all of those, but I tend to think that it's that last one. I think that Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you love me more than the other guys 
love me. And the reason I tend to think that is because earlier in, in, in Jesus' ministry, it really wasn't even that long ago, Peter was boasting and bragging about how he loved Jesus more than the other guys. In Matthew 26 and verse number 33, Peter said, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. They may stumble, but I love you more than they love you. I, I'm, I'm more committed to you than they are. I won't stumble, never. I won't, I won't curse you. That's not going to happen. Later on in verse number 35, Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will, I will not deny you. And so all the other disciples said so. So, Jesus, so Peter's kind of leading the way. He's like, you know, if they deny you, not me. I'm not going to deny you. Maybe three times, a couple of, you know, a few hours from now. <laughs> but no, I, you know, that, that boastful, prideful, arrogant, I will never deny you. Which is the equivalent of saying, I love you more than they do. Judas may betray you. Some of these other guys may leave you. But not so with me, Lord. Not so with me. So Peter... By the way, Peter has a problem saying no to the Lord often. You remember Jesus talks about going to the cross and, Jesus, and Peter gets in front of him and says, You're, no, that's, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, later on, Jesus talks about uh, Peter preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And no, that's uh, not going to happen. You, often you see Peter with this response to God. It's like, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet and this is Peter's natural response a lot of times to Jesus. But not the case here. How did he, he didn't respond with no. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me with agape love? Peter's response is, he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Now, it's interesting. He responds with yes. Jesus said, do you love me unconditionally? Peter's response is, yes, yes. But then Peter appeals to the, the, the sovereign nature of Jesus, knowing that he's God. He says, you know all things. You, you know my heart. You know my mind. You know the past. You know the present. You know the future. You know that I love you. And this is where there's a twist that we don't often see in the English language. He didn't say, you know that I agape you. He said that you know that I phileo you. In other words, you know that I have a, a friendship towards you. You know that I have an affection. You, you, know, that, you know that we're close. You know that I'm, I'm loyal to you in the sense of a friend. But he, he wouldn't respond to Jesus by saying, I have agape, I have unconditional love. Well, why is that? Well, just a few days earlier, he had denied Jesus, and he's weeping, and he's mournful because of it. He doesn't feel worthy to be able to respond to Jesus and say, yeah, unconditionally, I've said that before, and I made a fool of myself. So he's like, no, no, no I'm, I can be your friend. I can be your friend. By the way, that's good enough for Jesus. Because Jesus responds to Peter, and he says, he said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. The lambs are the, the young of the fold. Later, he'll call them sheep. That's the, old, that's the older, the mature, the adult of the fold. So he, he begins by talking to the youth of God's flock, and he says, feed them. And that's a Greek word also that's important. It, it doesn't just mean to take care of their, their food. It, it means to care for them, tend to them in a sense. It's a, you could also use the word shepherd. Shepherd does not have to do with just feeding. It talks about protecting and leading and guiding. And often people read this passage and only apply it to pastors. And I, and I think that's a shame because this does not just apply to, certainly it does apply to pastors, but it fit well beyond that. This applies to all of us as Christians, because the, the equivalence of what Jesus is telling Peter is this, if you love me, care for my people. That's what that means, feed my sheep, 
feed my lambs. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Take care of, care for my people. If you love me, then love the people that I love. Care for the people that I care for. L pray for them, serve them, lead them, guide them, protect them. Be what they need. Now this, is, this has got to be very reassuring and comforting for Peter. Pe as far as Peter's concerned, one of the reasons I believe Peter went back to fishing is because he's like, I'm done. I failed the Lord. Uh, I'm no longer worthy to serve him. I, I can't be in ministry anymore. Maybe I can get back my old job. And yet what Jesus is reassuring Peter is, no, I'm not done with you. Yes, you failed me. Yes, you messed up. But I'm not done with you, and so I want you to get back to the task at hand. I want you to care for those that are mine. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 21 says, And this command we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. This is the command. John 13 and verse number 34, Jesus said, A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So God is in the person of Jesus here. The, he's still the, the bodily form of God. He's saying to Peter, I'm not done with you, and I'm not done with the ministry that I have for you. I want you to love the brethren as I had given you command just a few days ago. Look at verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He uses the word agape again. Do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I phileo you. You know that I have affection to it. You know that we're friends. So once again, Peter, is, he, can't, he can't go there. He, he can't respond to Jesus in that sense like, you know me, Jesus. You, I failed you. Of course I can't love you unconditionally. That's already been proven. But I can, I can be your close friend. I, I can do my best. So Jesus responds to him again. Tend my sheep. Care for those who are mine, in other words. Verse 17 says he said to him the third time. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus calls out to him three times. He says a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Here's the plot twist. No longer does Jesus use the word agape, unconditional love. Now he's, he's bringing himself down to Peter's level. And, and Jesus says to Peter, yeah, but do you phileo me? Do you, are, you, are you a friend of mine? Do you have an affectionate love towards me? Obviously, this grips the heart of Peter, and so Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me or do you phileo me? Do you, are you a friend to me even? Are, are you going to abandon me again? Are you going to deny me again? Are, are you going to stop following me? And that grieved the heart of Peter because all Peter really wants is to love and honor and serve Jesus Christ. But the, the guilt of the past failure is too gripping for him. And the fact that Jesus is drawing it out is heart-wrenching for him. But once again, the reassuring command that Jesus gives to Peter is this. He said, feed my sheep. Aren't you glad that God will meet you where you are? Aren't you glad that God doesn't say, come up to my level of perfection and love and unconditional, you know, sacrificial giving, and I'll use you. And the God looks at you, I see where you are, I know who you are, and I know where you are in your walk, I know where you are in my life, and all I'm asking is, care for my people, follow me, love me. I'll bring you along until we get to the agape. I'll bring you along until at some point in your life there'll be that unconditional love. But this is where you are today, and so start there. Love the people of God right there where you are. Serve God right there where you are. Follow God right there where you are. And many of you need to hear that message right now. 
You're like, I'm not the best Christian in the world. I'm not the best follower of Christ. I don't love Jesus like I ought to love. And I've failed too many times in the past, and God knows that. He knows you better than you know you. And God looks at you where you're sitting, and he says, that where you're at, that's your starting point. Where you are at, forget the past. Where you're at, that's the starting point. Love me from there. Follow me from there. Love my church from there. And so Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. But there's another type of love here. There's a love for Jesus that leads us to a sacrificial life. In verse number 18, Jesus says to Peter, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. So when you were younger, you did what you wanted to do. You went where you wanted to go. You dressed yourself. You took care of yourself. But, he says, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. There's coming a time when you're an old man. You'll be led to a place that you do not want to be led. And your hands will be stretched out in a way that you do not want them to be stretched out, and you'll be at a place that you do not wish to be. This, obviously, in verse number 19, he says he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. What Jesus was telling Peter is this. This is where you are now. Yes, a few days ago, you denied me. You cursed me. You failed me utterly a few days ago. But my mercies endure forever. And my love for you endures forever. And my forgiveness to you is again and again renewed every morning. Feed my sheep, serve me, follow me, love me. And what does that mean for you, Peter? That means that one day you'll be an old man and you'll still be serving me. One day you'll be an old man and instead, like just a few days ago, when you said, if, if everyone else denies you, I'll not deny you. And just like a few days ago when you said, if, the, if everyone abandons you, I will die for you. If that's your wish, Peter, you will die for me as a martyr. But it won't be today. It'll be after a long life of living and serving me faithfully, which is exactly what happened. In the year 67 AD, Peter, along with Paul, was executed by the Emperor Nero. Peter, history tells us, he didn't, he was going to be, whereas Paul was um, beheaded, it tells us that Peter was crucified, and Peter didn't want to be crucified the way that his Lord was crucified. He, he told the executioner that I'm not worthy to die in the same manner that my Lord died. And so he asked that he would be crucified upside down. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but that's what church history has recorded. And it fits right in line with what Jesus has prophesied here, that you'll be an old man. Now, John, as he's writing this book, he's looking back in time. It was 20 years ago at the time that John is writing this book that Peter had died in the year 67 A.D. And a lot of the people in the church needed to hear that. Look, Peter, Peter died on a cross upside down, not because he failed God, not because he was rebellious towards Jesus, not because he was a failed leader in the church. No, 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 no. It was precisely because he was faithful. It was precisely because Jesus said this is what would happen. In fact, Peter, shortly before his death, in first or second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 14, Peter never forgot this promise by Jesus said, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Peter lived his life faithful for the rest of his life from this point forward, for the rest of his life. Why? Because he knew, he knew that God had forgiven him. He knew that God had placed him in the ministry. He knew that God had a purpose and a plan for his life and he stuck to it the rest of his life. So much so that you get in the book of Acts and there are times when Peter's in prison and he's, he's so calm, cool, and collected. He's laying there in the jail cell, sleeping between two, two soldiers, and he just seems so at peace. And the next morning he may be executed, but he's like, I'm not going to be that. Like Jesus said, I was going to be an old man. So do whatever you want. I, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know I don't die here. I die later on. I die as an old man. Jesus told me that. So, so Peter had confidence 
and boldness like never before. Why, why do you think just within a few days he's able to stand before the Sanhedrin? Doesn't care what they think anymore. Doesn't care if they're going to beat his back or crucify. Doesn't matter anymore. I have word from Jesus what my future holds. And so I'm going to tell even the Sanhedrin and all of the Roman world and all of the Jewish people, repent, turn from your sins and believe in Jesus Christ. And 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, thousands come to faith. And so God gave Peter this insight so that it would give him the courage to face the hard days ahead as he leads the church. Look at verse number 19 again, the middle of it. It says, And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Love for Jesus leads to faithful obedience. Jesus said, This is how you're going to die, and this is how old you're going to be when you die. But until that day comes, you have one job. Follow me. Now, ultimately, what Jesus was doing was calling Peter back to the original mission. Remember back in Luke chapter number 5, God calls Peter to follow. When he calls his disciples, he says, leave your nets, leave the boats and follow me. And the Bible says that they immediately left all and followed him. This is recorded in Matthew and also in Mark In Mark's account, Mark chapter 1, verse number 17, it says, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. You're not going to be fishers of men today, but you'll become fishers of men in the future, but you have to follow me. And that's the condition. If you want to see God use your life and you want to see abundance of fruit in your life, you have to follow Jesus. And on that day, it says that they immediately left their nets and they followed him. However, three years has passed and what is Jesus doing? He has gone back to his nets. He's going back to his old ways. And so Jesus is calling him back to the basics. He's calling him back to the plan. This, this, what you're doing is not the plan. Get back to the basics. Get back to the plan that I had initially called you to. And some of you, you've lost your way. You've, you've got so caught up in making your retirement plans or so caught up in your career and so caught up in your hobbies and so caught up in the events and things that's going on within your family that you forgot that years ago God called you to do some things for him. Years ago, God has a mission and a plan to stick to the basics of following him and you've got to where you're following yourself and all these other little life rabbit trails. And they may be enjoyable and they may be pleasurable, but we're in a war. It's a spiritual war, and we've been enlisted as soldiers in the army of God, and we have a task, we have a duty, we have a job to do, and God is calling you back. Follow me. Follow me to the things that I've asked you to do, the things that I've told you to do. John chapter 12 and verse number 26 says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse number 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Some of you, you're not seeing God in your life right now. You've questioned, where is the presence of God in my life? Well, you've been following yourself. You've been following others for so long that you've long, it's not that God has left you. You left God. And if you want to see the manifest presence of God in your life, then attach yourself to God. Follow God. Be where he's at. You're like, oh, I wish God was in my life. I remember the days when God was in my life. God could still be in your life. Get back to him. Go back to him. Stop blazing your own path of life. So those who follow him, he will manifest himself to them. John 15, verse number 10 says, Jesus spoke and said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you follow the rule of Christ, if you follow the command of Christ, if you're following Christ, you will abide in his love. 1 John 1, verse number 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians living a lie. 
And what I mean by that is they're faithful to come to church Sunday mornings. They're faithful to give here and there. They're faithful to do their Christianese things. But yet, their life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and the rest of the week doesn't look anything like followers of Christ. It doesn't sound like anything like followers of Christ. They're, they're doing their own thing. They're, they're saying that they follow Christ. They're portraying that they are followers of Christ, but they're living a lie because they're not truly followers of Christ. And so Jesus is calling us back to the basics, back to the simple plan. Just follow me. Look at verse number 20. Verse number 20. Love for Jesus is, shouldn't, we shouldn't be distracted by what other people are doing if we have true love for Jesus. Peter was distracted often by the storms around him, by the people around him. Peter's often distracted, and here's another example of this, verse number 20. Then Peter turning around, I love the imagery here. He had to face away from Christ in order to have this problem to begin with. The problem was he wasn't looking to Jesus, the author and finishers of his faith. The problem was he, wasn't, he was no longer following Jesus. He, he turned around to see if anybody else was following with him. He turned around to see if anybody else was doing what is right. He turned around to think about what other people are doing. In particular, in this time, it's John. And so uh, the, the phrasing here is perfect. Then Peter, turning around, said, or saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following whom also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? We all know this to be the Apostle John. So Peter turns around, he sees John, and so verse 21 says, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? So here's Peter, like God's giving instructions to Peter. Jesus is expressing his love and his mercy and his mission and his plan for Peter, and Peter's like, well, what about him? What, what, what are you going to say to him? What's he going to do? I love Jesus' response into verse 22. If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? What is it to you, Peter? Why does what I do in his life matter to you? Why does his plan and his purpose that I alone have given to him, and it's between me and him, why does that matter to you? He says, you follow me. Don't get distracted, Peter. Don't get distracted by what you see going on in other lives of other people in the church. You keep your eyes on me, the author and finisher of your faith. You focus on your following Christ, your faith in Christ. Stop looking around at the other people and say, well, I don't know if they're following Jesus as they ought to, and I don't think they're saying the things that they ought to say, and I don't think they're being faithful like they ought to be faithful. And we start to... Compare ourselves among ourselves, what Paul later on told the church of Corinth, that that's not wise. It's foolish to look around and compare yourself with each other. I'm a good Christian. Why? Because if I compare myself with Scott Schaub, who's a horrible, nasty, pathetic, awful Christian, then I'm good. We're all, look at that. No amens. None. Not a single one. And the whole room's like, how dare he? It's a <laughs> So if we start comparing ourselves, Paul says that's foolishness. The only person you compare yourself with is Jesus. That's, that's who you compare. He's the model. He's the one to look to. You don't look to other men and women and say, that's who I'm going to be as a Christian. No, you look to Jesus. Say, that's, that's the model that I'm going to follow. I see a lot of this, even over the last couple of weeks, just this distraction that comes about. There's so much fighting in the Christian world. Well, this man said this, and I don't like that he said that, and this is my opinion, and they just fight, 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 and we're so distracted looking at each other, comparing each other. Jesus says, no, no, keep your focus on me. Follow me. Stop turning around and looking at everybody else. Look at me. Go where I go. Do what I do. Say what I say. Love the way I love. So Peter is given instructions here on how to follow faithfully to Jesus. If you would look at verse number 23. Love for Jesus produces a love for God's word. Verse 23 says, Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die, this disciple being John, the apostle John. And, you know, you might... 
to be honest, if we lived in the end of the turn of the century, the first century, we might be tempted to think the same thing. Everybody, everybody's dead. Like, they all died a long time ago. John's in his mid-90s. Nobody lives to their mid-90s in the first century. He's like this crazy old man compared to everybody else. He may be, at the point of writing this book, he may be the oldest man on earth. People didn't live that long back then. And so people, their big, rumors are starting to spread. He's going to live forever. He's not dying. He, he's he's going to live until Jesus returns. So the rumor started spreading. The word started getting around. Verse 23, in the middle of it, he says, Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? In other words... They began to misinterpret what Jesus had said. They began to not really think much or focus much on what Jesus actually said or what Jesus actually meant, started coming up with their own interpretations. And this is one of the major problems that we see in the world today. In fact, one of the biggest problems in the church today is not that we don't know what Jesus has said, it's that we are now reinterpreting what Jesus has said. Sinful people always hear what they want to hear, but those who love Jesus pay attention to the details and the meaning and the purpose of Scripture. They're not searching the Scriptures to align, find where in the Bible can I find it to align with my beliefs and my practices and my lusts. And this is what so many Christians do these days. I, I want to be in this homosexual relationship, and so let me find all the Scriptures that I can find to back it up. Uh, I want to do this particular type of career, and that's kind of looked down on by most Christians. So I'm going to find the type of Bible passage that will, uh, that will back up what it is that I'm trying to do in life. And on and on the list goes. We search out the scriptures trying to figure out how can I make the Bible fit my life. And all along, all you're doing is designing God after your own image. You're creating your own morals. Creating your own God. Creating your own Bible. Those who love Jesus loves the words of Jesus. They love what Jesus said, they love what Jesus meant, and they hang on to it. And not just the words of Jesus, because we are not just red-letter Christians. We love the Bible. We love all of the Scripture. And John ends this book by saying in verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that he that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written in one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. John says, what you've been given, what has been recorded for you in Scripture is exactly what you needed. And if we were to write down everything Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, all of the truth, all of the depth, the riches of the meaning of it, the, the world itself, the oceans of the world would not, be, would not be able to contain how many books would be written on that subject. And I own thousands of books. I own thousands of books. And there are probably millions of Christian books that have been written, and there'll be maybe millions more, who knows, until the return of Christ, written about the scriptures, written about Jesus, written about the truth that's in the Bible. But at the end of the day, all Christians really, truly need is their Bible, what God has preserved for us, what God has given to us. And we can speculate about the other things, you know, people speculate, well, what did Jesus do after he was 12 years old, or what did he do before he was 12, you know, what happened in all those silent years, and there's all kinds of questions that we have. We'll know the answers when we get to heaven. But the things that we need to know, the things that are of most importance, the things that will save your life and transform your life and conform your life to the image of Christ are, have all been recorded in Scripture. And those who truly love Jesus love His words. They love the Bible. Those who truly love Jesus loves His flock, the church. Those who truly love Jesus follow Jesus and are obedient to Jesus. Those who truly love Jesus are faithful to Jesus. I hope that 
not in an arrogant, bragging, boastful way that you say, I love Jesus, but in, in the same sense, in the same heart that Peter spoke in this passage, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know me. You know where I'm at. You know my past. You know my failures. And still, you know I love you. And I, I may not love you as I ought to love you, and I may not love you where I want to love you, but this is where I am today. I do love you. And I pray that you'll bring me along to love you more deeply and intimately and more passionately and fervently in the days ahead. And I hope that that's all of our prayer this morning. This is a sermon to Christians, the followers of Christ. And so for us who have been followers of Christ for many, many years, who long ago said, yes, I love Jesus, I pray that you would reaffirm that love today, rekindle that love today. And say, wherever I am today, tomorrow, I will love you more. I will follow you more. I hope that's your prayer.